So today's speaker is Balint Kotsor, who did his PhD at the Technical University of Munich in mathematical physics, developing phase space representations of quantum systems. Now Balint is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford in Professor Simon Benjamin's group. The group works on applications of near-term noisy quantum devices, including the variational quantum algorithms and error mitig and mitigation protocols. And I think that today Balint is going to tell us about their super exciting work on the VQE algorithm and things around it. So thank you very much for, for joining us virtually to, to give this talk. Okay, so thank you very much, David, for the very kind introduction. And yesterday, I'd like to talk about, in general, about variational quantum algorithms and some very nice, interesting ideas, new ideas. And if I have some time, I'd like to also touch on the topic of, of quantum error mitigation. Um, so as you know, the motivation is that quantum computers promise to solve very important problems in practice. And that's why hardware companies around the world have been building in increasingly large uh, quantum processors. And in fact, we have already entered the regime of quantum supremacy, where the quantum states that these devices can prepare are already so complex that we cannot even predict their behavior with, with classical resources. And Google did the first demonstration of this um, supremacy experiment. And indeed, this was a huge milestone in, in the field. But I have to say, it's not a practically useful application. And especially that uh, they had noisy quantum gates. In general, we will always have noisy quantum gates. And the problem with that is if we increase the number of qubits, for which we also have to increase the number of noisy gates, we see an exponential decay of the fidelity, where the fidelity is the measure of, of uh, the quality of the quantum computation. And of course, there is an answer to this. One needs to use quantum error correction to correct these errors and not to have a drop in the fidelity. But error correction is so extremely expensive that it's prohibitive for current hardware and it will definitely be prohibitive for the next years to come. So the question is natural to ask. We already have uh, quantum devices that are so complex, we cannot uh, use classical resources to simulate them. So can we not use them for practical applications? And the answer is, in principle, we can actually make use of these in practice. Instead of um, using these typical uh, future term algorithms which require extremely deep circuits, many, many hundreds of or millions of gates. Instead, we try to use shallow circuits where we only have a limited depth that we can run because of the noise in the gates. But we can still prepare extremely complex quantum states with these. And the idea is that we take parameterized quantum gates, meaning that we build this shallow circuit and in this circuit, every gate has some parameter, some classical parameter or knob that we can turn and adjust. And with this, we can basically perform a search in Hilbert space that may or may not be useful for some tasks. And it has been shown that even 50 or 100 imperfect noisy qubits might be very useful for solving pra practical problems. And in general, the idea is that we have these parameterized gates. We build a circuit out of them, a circuit that we know can prepare complex quantum states that are not accessible to classical uh, quantum computers. And obviously, there is a question, how do we build those kind of circuits? But we assume these problems can be solved by better understanding the problem. And Obviously, if we have shallow circuits, we accumulate less noise and we can still achieve some practical value. And in the end, we can perform measurements, obviously not perfect measurements, but there is some tolerance of these algorithms. We perform these measurements and estimate some sort of a cost function. Typically, this cost function is, is an energy of some, some Hamiltonian uh, for which we can 
measure term by term these Pauli expectation values. And the most obvious application of this protocol is the so-called variational quantum eigensolver, in which we try to find the ground state of some Hamiltonian by preparing a parametrized quantum state, measuring its corresponding energy, which is the F here, and then try to minimize this energy as a function of the parameters. And this is very, very useful for solving problems in chemistry, material science, and so on. But interestingly, it has been shown that this problem is naturally extend to other domains, such as op combinatorial optimizations and graph algorithms. And since then, so many other applications uh, have been found that variational algorithms have been have grown into an entire field. Uh, one can, for example, efficiently simulate quantum dynamics or even solve linear algebra problems, um, which is strongly related to quantum machine learning. And I will shortly mention our work on quantum metrology. And if anybody is interested, in, please refer to these three reviews, which came out in the last few months. And these gave a very nice overview of this huge activity going on around variational algorithms. But as I showed you earlier, most of these applications in the end boil down to optimizing some expectation value. Where you see here we have some Hamiltonian. It's, it's just an observable that we can, the expectation value we can measure at the end of the circuit by performing measurements in the standard basis. And this is our quantum state, our parametrized quantum state that we prepare. And then the task boils down to finding the minimum of this energy surface. However, this is highly non-trivial and it requires some classical optimization algorithm. Typically one uses gradient descent for this, but there are so many other optimization routines. The problem is that still we face so-called Baron plateaus, meaning that this cost function tends to be flat almost everywhere in Hilbert space if our parametrized quantum circuit is too complex. And there are so many other problems. And that's why we need to really focus on, on finding better optimization algorithms. And a very, very promising class of algorithms uses a matrix. And this algorithm was actually derived in analogy to, to imaginary time evolution. So as you know, if we evolve a Hamiltonian, if we evolve a state under a Hamiltonian, we have an I here in this propagator operator. If we evolve under an imaginary time condition, then we only have e to the minus th. And this basically dissipates the energy of this quantum state. And this guarantees that for t goes to infinity, we reach the ground state. So in some sense, this is an optimization that, that is guaranteed not to get stuck in local optima, which, is, which sounds superior to gradient descent. And indeed, in this paper, our group has derived the corresponding evolution equations, meaning that if we have parameters at time t, so these are the parameters of the quantum state or quantum circuit, then how do we update? In, in a standard gradient descent protocol, we just have the identity matrix here, and we only use the gradient vector to update the parameters. But this inverse matrix corrects the gradient and it inputs some quantum information because the gradient only captures this classical information about the curvature of this classical surface, energy surface. And in a later paper, it was shown that this update rule is very strongly related to the so-called natural gradient optimization routine used in classical machine learning. And there, the matrix is actually the so-called Fisher information, classical Fisher information matrix. And it was shown to be equivalent to this A matrix in some cases, in some special cases. And in this paper, we actually uh, made the ultimate generalization of this idea and we relate this problem to so-called Riemannian optimization 
and this in general applies to any quantum circuit, noisy quantum circuit, and even non-unitary quantum circuit. And in general, we can state that the update rule needs to use the so-called quantum Fisher information. So in that sense, it's in complete analogy to the classical machine learning case where we use the classical Fisher information. But let me know how this works. So obviously, if we replace this matrix with the identity, then we get back the classical gradient descent approach. But if we introduce this quantum Fisher information matrix, then we can correct the gradient vector with information about uh, how the parameters co-depend because the parameter space is not an orthogonal coordinate system and changing one parameter in the circuit might have the exact same effect as changing another parameter later in the circuit. And this quantum Fisher information exactly captures this kind of uh, information about the states and their sensitivities. And in fact, it has been used in quantum metrology to capture the sensitivity of quantum states. But in general, it's related to the geometry of quantum states. And the idea is that in parameter space, where we have theta values, theta one, theta two, and so on, we span a coordinate system or a manifold. And this is obviously not an orthogonal coordinate system, but we can express the distance in this coordinate system, but it's an entirely classical system. Then we are interested in what is the actual distance in state space in the Hilbert space where our quantum states live. And the quantum Fisher information makes a connection between these two completely different regimes, between the classical parameter space and the distance in Hilbert space. And so this is basically the explanation why this uh, thing works and why it corrects for the quantum behavior. And it's also nice to understand that how, how we can characterize this distance in Hilbert space. And for pure states, it's expressed as the scalar product between two states. For general mixed states, it can be expressed as the fidelity between density matrices. Obviously, these two are compatible and they boil down to each other. And if we have sort of classical states, meaning that the quantum state, state vector only encodes classical data, then this distance can be expressed in terms of this Patakaria coefficient. And indeed, we did some numerical simulations, a typical example where we take some Hamiltonian that has some resemblance to practical applications. In this case, it's, it's a spin ring. And we can show that indeed this uh, quantum natural gradient approach significantly outperforms gradient descent. And here the plot shows as a function of the number of qubits, how close we can get to the ground state. And the green one is the quantum Fisher information. It gets orders of magnitude closer to the ground state. Uh, actually, is there any question about this part? I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Maybe I have just a sure. question. So you introduced this matrix A that you use to you know, update your parameter vector. And yes. then you said that in, in some scenarios, this, this A can be shown to, to be successfully modeled by the, the Fisher information matrix. Classical one, yes, that's right. So, so what, what's the requirement on the kind of experiment for A to, to be the Fisher information? So when, when does that happen? Uh, it's actually right here. So when the quantum state is sort of encodes classical data, meaning that we only have non-negative coefficients here. So it can be related to a classical probability distribution. Then it turns out that the metric tensor in, in the state space in quantum mechanics is the same as the classical Fisher information, which is defined over statistical manifolds. But basically because our state space is just a statistical manifold. Okay. And, and then, so, and then what was, when you switch to the quantum Fisher information, uh, what, what was the... 
Ah, uh, so the idea is that um, this idea, all these ideas, for example, here, yeah. use the fact that, for example, in classical machine learning, we let's say we optimize over probability distributions. Yeah. That's a Riemannian manifold, and the metric tensor of that manifold is the classical Fisher information. And in complete analogy, we know for decades that the geometry of quantum states is characterized by this quantum Fisher information matrix. And this is just another Riemannian manifold. And we just want to compute the Riemannian gradient. Yeah. I'm just thinking that quite often it's very hard to, you know, the, the, you, often you can't access the the, fish, the quantum Fisher information matrix. Like, oh, that's right. Yes, that's so I guess you're, you're, so is this why you're assuming this kind of specific type of encoding of your quantum state? And then. Uh, so it turns out, um, unfortunately, I don't have that slide here, but in this paper, if you work out how to approximate the quantum Fisher information, under some assumption. So we assume that the noise is generated by individual gates, meaning that it has a high, high entropy. And in that case, we can use a so-called swap test to estimate the quantum Fisher information. And it works extremely well. It gives an extremely good approximation. But in the general case, the quantum Fisher information is extremely hard to work out. But there are now, actually in these reviews, there are now many papers that try to work out the quantum Fisher information using variational techniques. Right. Really interesting. OK, thanks. It's, it's in our entire subfield to, to find this, because there are obviously applications in metrology. Yeah, so I, I work a bit on metrology, so I recognize some of these things. And... Sure. So I'm going to touch a bit on metrology, too, in, in a yeah. bit. I think. OK, thanks. That, that was just my question. I, I can't see any other questions under the Q&A button, usually people, I think, will come in at the end and, and kind of... Okay. Okay, so the next topic is about so-called our approach, which we call quantum analytic descent. And the problem, what I showed you before, is that we still need to work out the gradient vector, meaning that at the end of this circuit, we need to estimate the gradient of the expectation value which becomes extremely costly when we get close to the optimum. Say, if we are far away from the optimum, the gradient is large. And as soon as we get very close to the optimum, the gradient becomes very small. And you know, if we perform measurements at the end of the circuit, then the state collapses randomly into some computational basis state. And in order to figure out an expectation value, we need to run the algorithm many, many times to average out the outputs of the quantum computer and suppress the so-called shock noise. But if the information, for example, the gradient is our information, if it's very, very small, then we need to suppress the shock noise extremely below this tiny information threshold. And that's why the approach becomes very, very expensive. And in this work, we try to use classical computers more uh, to work out some analytical approximation of the energy surface and compute that classically. The idea is that uh, let's take this expectation value and let's assume we only have a single quantum gate in our circuit. Let's say we have a single qubit observable and just a single qubit state psi. And this is prepared by an X rotation applied to the zero state. Then the question, what is the energy surface? How does it look like? And it turns out it's just a cosine, a cosinusoidal function. It's extremely simple. And even though the parameter space is in some sense infinite dimensional because we have infinitely many possibilities to, to evaluate this uh, cost function, we know that the system only has two degrees of freedom. And there exists a representation where we only need to capture two degrees of freedom, basically the prefactors in this. In fact, it, it turns out it has three degrees of freedom in this case. But this naturally generalizes to, to arbitrary gates, which are similar to the sigma single qubit gates which have the same algebra, meaning that they square to the identity. 
And these are, in fact, the most important gates in practice. These include all the single qubits, x, y, and z rotations, but it, they also include entangling gates, such as the x, x, y, y, z, z entangling gates, or even multi-qubit gates, such as the x, 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 Milner Sorensen type interaction gates. And if we have these gates, only these gates in our circuits, then we can work out exactly how the surface will look like, this energy surface. And it turns out it's a trigonometric polynomial, but it has exponentially many terms. So if we have, if we have new parameters, then it turns out that the polynomial has three to the new degrees of freedom. But the interesting bit is that we can throw away the less important contributions and just focus on the most important terms. And then we can work out a classical approximation, which only requires quadratic effort to compute. And it provides a, a quartic approximation. So we can compute the gradient up to an error delta to the power of four. Uh, there, there is a reason why it's to the four, but suffice to say, the energy has an error that has a power of three in delta. The idea is that we use the quantum computer to calculate the energy at a quadratic number of points. And then we know exactly the approximation and we can use that in a classical computation. And still the classical computation is non-trivial, but it's relatively simple because we just need to work out many, many multiplications of different cosines and sines. And we have written an efficient C code and it confirms that indeed the classical computation takes uh, cubic time and it's, it only takes reasonable like a few minutes to work out a single step in gradient descent. So it's a very promising uh, class of algorithms because we can apply it to any kind of gradient based optimization, even to natural gradient because we can apply this same approximation to the quantum Fisher information matrix. In fact, how the matrix entries change with, with respect to the parameters. And yes, I'd like to now go on to the next topic, but if there is any question about this, please feel free to ask now. I think again we will we'll just push through to the end I think and then and then we'll we'll do okay, it. Sure. So the next topic is on metrology and we can apply these variational algorithms to metrology. And you might know this already. I'll just quickly go, go through the basics. So in metrology our aim is to estimate for example a magnetic or electric field to the ultimate precision. And for that we need to prepare a probe quantum state. And we let this quantum state evolve under some interaction Hamiltonian. Then it picks up some information about the field, omega. And then we measure in some measurement basis to figure out what this omega can be. But the problem is that after the measurement or during the measurement, the state collapses into one of the eigenstates of the measurement operator. And because of this, we need to repeat this protocol many, many times to suppress this so-called shot noise. Um, and highly non-trivial problem is if we have noise during this sensing period, then what is the optimal probe state that will give us the most precision? It's been well known that if there is no noise during the interaction stage, then the so-called GHZ state is the optimal one. But it's non-trivial to work out the optimal states for general noise models and it's classically intractable. So our idea was to use a quantum computer to figure out what the optimal states are. And the idea is we use the same kind of shallow parametrized quantum circuit to encode our quantum state, our sensing probe state. Then we simulate how this state evolves under the noisy sensing period. So the interaction with the Hamiltonian. And then we use the same kind of a shallow parametrized quantum circuit to decode the information and do measurements in the standard basis. And here at the end, we evaluate the precision of the quantum states 
via the so-called quantum Fisher information. And we did this in a manner that this kind of algorithm or approach can be implemented on near-term quantum hardware. And indeed, some, some groups have already tried this on, the, uh, on one of the IBM devices, and they confirmed our findings. So basically, here are the results. We simulated a different number of qubits classically under different noise models. Here it shows the examples of dephasing and amplitude damping noise. And it's been well known that if there is noise in the system, then we lose the so-called Heisenberg scaling, which would result in a quadratic increase here. But we only see a linear increase. And that's because noise destroys this quantum advantage. But still, one can gain an absolute prefactor by using entangled quantum states. But the interesting bit is that the GHZ provides the same kind of sensitivity as the classical product state under dephasing noise. Uh, the interesting thing we found, actually so far, there is nothing new here because these have been worked out analytically before. And it's been known that so-called squeeze states are asymptotically optimal. However, in the amplitude damping channel, we found something very, very surprising. And in fact, if we restrict our search to the symmetric subspace, meaning that we only search over symmetric quantum states, then we reach this kind of precision. But here, if we do not make any restriction on the, on the quantum states, meaning that we just uh, tune these gates arbitrarily in our circuit, and we allow them to find non-trivial solutions outside the symmetric subspace, then you see we can significantly increase on the performance of the symmetric subspace. And this is surprising because the evolution is entirely symmetric. So the Hamiltonian is completely symmetric. All the well-known solutions in the literature are all symmetric. And even the noise model is perfectly symmetric because every qubit goes, undergoes the same amplitude damping uh, error. Yet the system finds something non-trivial and that breaks this permutation symmetry. And when we put our paper on archive, a student actually contacted us that um, he was trying to prove, or he was thinking about proving that symmetric states are the optimal. And he was very glad to find our paper online because now we have found a counterexample to this. But the problem is that these kind of quantum algorithms perform the optimization and give us some results, but they don't really give an explanation why this result is the optimal one. And we had to work out why this actually happens. And the sketch of the idea is that in case of amplitude damping, as you know, the error causes one of the qubits to flip from one to zero. And it turns out the optimal states have this general form. If we take this part away, then we basically have a GHZ state here, which is optimal for uh, noiseless sensing. But as soon as we, as we turn on the noise, this part here plays a very important role. And it can actually tell us passively which qubit was corrupted. And it can sa still save the quantum state from totally getting corrupted because a simple GHZ state is com completely corrupted by a flip like this. But this state can still save the quantum state or part, an important part of the quantum state, and can even tell us where the error occurred by passively correcting it. But in turn, this part breaks the permutation symmetry of the system. OK. And at this point, I'd like to ask if I still have time to go a little bit into error mitigation. Yeah, definitely. This is okay. super interesting. We don't want to stop you now. OK, great. So just in a few minutes. So quantum error mitigation is sort of a cheap version of quantum error correction. And the idea is that we try to learn how noise affects a quantum state. In fact, we cannot even correct the quantum states. We are only interested in how the observables are affected by noise. And we try to learn about this and correct back to the ideal states. And there are so many techniques out there now. The first one was probably the simplest one, the so-called zero noise extrapolation. The idea is that 
assume we have two quantum computers. One operates at an error level epsilon, and the other one operates at an error level two epsilon. Then we can measure expectation values and basically linearly extrapolate back to the case where we have zero epsilon error. Um, obviously, this has much more and much more sophisticated variants. And there are some even more sophisticated ideas out there, for example, the so-called quasi-probability representation, or the idea that we use classically simulable Clifford circuits so that we can classically work out the ideal expectation value and then use a quantum computer to work out the same noisy expectation value and then try to learn what is the noise in the quantum system. Uh, in general, these do not increase the qubit counts as opposed to quantum error correction, but they cannot provide an exponential suppression of the errors, which quantum error correction can do. But quantum error correction is prohibitively expensive because it increases the qubit count by hundreds or thousands of a factor of hundreds or thousands. And so this uh, very recent idea where we prepare a few copies and we entangle them can be implemented with near-term quantum devices and it can provide exponential suppression. And I'll show you very briefly how the idea works. I wanted to remark that when I put my paper on the archive, the week after the Google team put on the archive a very, very similar paper, and they basically worked out the exact same idea. And this just shows that this idea has been around and it was just waiting for somebody to, to explore how this really can be applied. In fact, this kind of circuit has been used for so-called generalized swap tests and to measure Rényi entropies of quantum states. And just with a tiny modification, it has a completely new uh, range of applications, meaning we can suppress errors in observables. The idea is that we use this so-called derangement operator. We take n input registers. Ideally, we would only have one of these registers that would be perfect and that would perform our quantum computation. But because we have noise in the gates, we have a mixed quantum state row and we are trying to correct the errors in this quantum state row. So in order to suppress the error, we prepare n copies of the same state, meaning that in parallel we have n quantum processors doing the same quantum circuit and they do it completely independently and at the end we entangle them with this so-called derangement operator. And this operator is a generalization of the swap operation. So in some sense, it shuffles around the different quantum registers. And this allows us to measure an expectation value. But the important bit is that we shuffle around the quantum registers and that excludes any quantum state from the measurement process that breaks the permutation symmetry. And it only includes the perfect ideal state, uh, which is permutation symmetric. It's just n copies of the exact same perfect quantum state, but it also includes the states that have exactly the same errors in them. So in that sense, it does not perfectly correct the state, but it still exponentially suppresses the errors because you see this probability is raised to the power of n. And so we did some numerical simulations and the results are very, very promising. And some analytical results about the scalings show that if we increase the Rényi entropy of the quantum state, meaning that the noise is more and more random, then we can exponentially increase the efficiency of this, of this error suppression scheme. And for example, even if the copies of the quantum state are not non-identical. In fact, they can be arbitrarily different. The approach still works very nicely and we get an exponential suppression. So here, this plot shows how many copies we have, one, two, three, four copies. And this axis shows the error in the measurement process. And as you can see, these are now 
randomly generated observables and quantum states, we see an exponential decay. And here, this is an upper bound, an analytical upper bound that guarantees that indeed we have this exponential scaling. Okay, so in summary, the idea is that we already have quantum devices that can create very, very complex quantum states. And there is an excitement about these variational quantum algorithms because they can in principle help us solving very important problems such as finding ground states and analogous problems like QAOA for solving graph optimization problems and beyond, for example, applications in metrology are also possible. But there are still many crucial points and problems that one needs to address. One of the most pressing matters is how to mitigate the noise in these quantum circuits. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Balin, thank you very much for, for a very, very nice talk. Um, I, I'm gonna repeat to all the participants that if you'd like to ask Balin a question, just uh, press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and write your name there or write the question there. And then I will promote you to a panelist. So I see that Tyson has just asked a question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna promote Tyson to, to a panelist and then you can come on board and ask the question. Let's see, we have... Oh, am I asking this question myself? Go for Hi, it. Hi, how's it going? I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, um, to substantiate why uh, classical simulation of quantum variational algorithms are important despite that we have NISC machines available today. Oh, definitely. That's a very important point. So obviously these ideas, we can work out analytically with pen and paper, but here already with the quantum uh, metrology case, we found that simulating these ideas classically is very important because we, we learn how they perform and we can improve the performance of, of these algorithms. And even here, just classically simulating how a quantum computer would go about solving this metrology problem gave a much better uh, solution than the best classical known algorithm. And so that's a very interesting case because here what we did, these are actually simulations, classical simulations with our um, own quantum simulator, so-called Quest program. And we work out how the quantum computer would perform this task. And in fact, it gives us better results than with any other classical approach, just because it's designed to be less resource intensive, meaning that we restrict the optimization to a so, so small section of the entire Hilbert space and only perform the search within that with some tractable classical parameterizations. And so this is a very promising uh, area as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, um, are you happy with that answer, Tyson, or do you have any follow-up questions? Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. Okay, so then I see, I think, uh, Jordan, you were next to ask a question, and then we have Sheng Hao and then Gregory Boyd. So, so Jordan, if, if you just go for it. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thanks. Uh, so... <laughs> Maybe David already asked this question, but uh, I was wondering what is, uh, how is the Fisher quantum Fisher information exactly defined? Like, is there like analytical expression for it? Actually, there are many ways to, to define it. Yeah, um, I was just particularly well, interested maybe, in, in the case of, uh, of the angle. The simplest one I can think of is that we have the fidelity between two quantum states. It's, uh, you know, defined via this trace, row, yeah. square root of row one, and so on. So we take two quantum states. Um, one is the quantum state at parameter theta, and the other one is at parameter theta plus some tiny variation. Then we compute the fidelity between these two very, very close neighboring quantum states and divide by the variation in the parameter. In some so, sense, so, 
Yes. So, so it's like we vary the state a little bit by changing the variational parameters. That's there. right. Yes. And in okay. some sense, it's, it's like a finite difference derivative. And you can generalize this idea to, to an actual derivative in this space. Yeah. Thanks. So I think you also mentioned Balint in your, in your talk or kind of was tangent on that, like if you want a more kind of geometric interpretation of it, it's <laughs> the quantum Fisher information is, is, is the real part of the quantum geometric tensor, which is like a, a, a Riemannian right. tensor on the, on the manifold of parameters in, in your... That's right, but only for, for pure states. Only for pure states, yes. yes. Um, so, Sheng Hao, are you on board on the, on the call? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I can, I can hear you. Okay. So, so I, I just had a question about your um, novel error mitigation technique. I was wondering if you could show me the, uh, how you benchmarked your technique again. I mean this plot, right? Yes, yes, this plot. So, so uh, what kind of algorithm are you running to benchmark this technique? So in the present case, it was not even tied to an, to an algorithm because we know it works in general. So we have completely general proofs about this exponential suppression. Right. So the only aim of this plot is to demonstrate that if I randomly generate observables, uh -huh. they're actually poly strings. And I think a few hundred of, of these poly strings were generated in a 12 qubit system. And then you can see that we see nicely this exponential suppression. Okay, so am I right in saying like the, the x-axis in these plots, um, but by four copies of rho, you mean we go from 12 qubits to 48 qubits, and then we achieve a certain error mitigation. Exactly, that's right, yes. Okay. Um, right, so, so I was just wondering, do you think if it's like reason, um, this increase in qubits, if this, re if this is reasonably achievable on NISC, devices, if we want to use this mitigation technique on, for example, a VQE algorithm to solve for some like 50 qubit problem? Yes, I think uh, it's very reasonable, especially compared to quantum error correction, uh, because during the computation, which is the heavy part of the whole process, they can be completely separate and completely independent, meaning right. they can be even in principle physically separate ion traps that we okay. only entangle at the end of the computation. And this, this part of the circuit, this derangement operator, can be shown to be very shallow, meaning we only need a linear number of gates. Right. It's sort of equivalent to a depth, a constant depth circuit. I see, okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, for that. Uh, I think we have Gregory Boyd with, with another question. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about the, um, the expansion for the quantum analytic descent. Mm -hmm. um, are those, uh, those expansion coefficients which you calculate on the quantum computer, is that done in a sort of feedback loop? They depend on theta or you just, do you just calculate them once? Uh, yes, that's right. So we just calculate them once we select uh, a reference parameter. It's the reference point where we take our approximation. If we go away from that reference point, we introduce an error. <clears throat> the point is that we take this reference point and with respect to this, we measure the energy at some different parameter shifted values. And this allows us to exactly work out these coefficients and then exactly work out this approximation. Right. So if you know that you're moving away from the original point, you may have to calculate them again. Uh, exactly. So the idea is that we, we measure these points, we have our classical approximation, then we start to use our classical computer. We perform a gradient descent step classically, then another one, and then another one, which means we increase this data parameter because we get further and further away from our reference points. But this is still performed entirely in the classical computer. And as soon as we see that we are too far away from the reference point, we then need to again redetermine these coefficients. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, um, I see that the Q&A tab is now empty. So if, if anyone on the, on the attendees list are, are sitting there with a question they're eager to ask, this is kind of the, the last chance to do so. Um, I just thought I'd give like kind of a general question to you, Valent, that I've been thinking about. So, you know, how, how far away are we from like an experimental perspective to actually see some, some advantage from a VQE algorithm? Um, like, mm -hmm. what do we need? And, and, and as you're an expert, like how far away is it? Thanks very much. I, I think, um, yeah, that's a very, very good question. And I think there are still many problems that need to be solved. And uh, I think the, one of the most promising applications that will be relevant in practice is probably quantum chemistry. Uh, but there we have extremely good classical uh, computational methods that chemists have been developing for really decades, if not half a century. And those are extremely efficient and very good, and they will be hard to beat by these uh, variational algorithms. Uh, but still, as, as you all know, just increasing the qubit count by a factor of 10 will be intractable to a classical computer. So still we, and, and we are already very, very close to the point where we can make practical use of these quantum devices. Uh, good question. Uh, I think there are still many problems to be solved, particularly the, the shock noise limitation, because for, for these VQEs, we need to perform measurements many, many times. And that means, for example, we need to measure an expectation value like this 10 to the six times or, or something like that. And a single quantum computer will probably not be relevant in that sense. We need multiple quantum computers working in parallel to work these expectation values out. And so I think we still still have some way to go there. OK, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see your take on it. But like, basically, it's, it's going to happen, but, but, but we're not quite there yet. And there, there are still interesting yes. papers to be published before we're there. Yes. So certainly, shock noise is one of the main limiting, limiting factors. Yeah. And the other, other one is the optimization part. Because still, we need to, first of all, have either a very, very good guess where the optimum should be and start the optimization from that very good guess, which might may or may not be possible in practice. And we know that if we have no idea about a good guess, then we will typically run into these so-called barren plateaus, meaning that the cost function is flat almost everywhere. And that's another problem. But huge progress is being made in these regards and many papers are coming out in this, in this topic. Yeah. So I'm very optimistic. That's good to hear. Yeah. Obviously, we're a lot of people working on this. So it would be it would be yeah. tragic if, if, if we're not optimistic. Um, I think, yeah, thanks for a really excellent talk. I thought this was was really interesting to see all the new stuff that's been coming from, from you and your group. Um, 